But this is Mr. Suppy, and he, would, he was actually present here the day Bob Concilio was killed. And he was actually one of seven people who were over there in this building and in the trees. And he was actually present at the time he was killed. You don't believe oh, no. uh, What happened was they shouted out to him. Uh, he answered in kind of a weak voice, like somebody who was really suffering from the cold or was in pain, something like this. You know, they weren't sure of uh, what he was going to do. So they opened fire on him. And uh, they reckon he was injured in the mouth here as he came down this, uh, this track here. And when he got to about here, he was hit by a bullet which somehow uh, exploded or set light to a phosphorus grenade that was in his uh, chest pocket, probably. Bob Concilio's death was quickly followed by the capture, here, of Mark Coburn. He was already wounded. Ahmed's telling me he was actually in this ditch with his police unit when Mark Coburn came across this tomato field. And he was actually crawling. Can Zahaf, yeah? Zahaf, on the ground. On the ground. And he was on the ground? No, no, no. He was on the ground. He was crawling on his belly across the tomato field and he wasn't carrying a rifle, he was carrying a bayonet in his hand. There were six or seven of them, and they opened fire on him. They shot him, and he went down. He screamed out something in English, but they, they didn't know what it was. And they went towards him out of the ditch. They found he was really shivering from the cold. You know, he was really cold, and the blood was pouring out of his leg. Uh, but he was still conscious. And Ahmed himself picked Coburn up and carried him into Bawahadak, yani. Uh, into it, he, he and another uh, another guy carried uh, the body, you know, still alive, of course, across the field, put him in the back of a Land Cruiser. Ahmed brought him a blanket, covered him over because he was really, obviously, very affected from the uh, the coal. And he said thank you in English uh, to Ahmed. He said that from here they took him to the hospital, and the doctor said he needed blood. He lost a lot of blood and Ahmed himself volunteered to give him blood. He had a blood test and found it was the wrong group. But one of the police uh, officers with Ahmed actually gave him blood and, uh, of course, saved his life. Meanwhile, two other members of the patrol, Dinger and Legs Lane, had made it to the banks of the Euphrates River. In the freezing darkness, they made the fatal decision to swim. Michael crosses the river to a small inhabited island where Legs Lane and Dinger took refuge in this pump house. But by the morning, Legs Lane had advanced hypothermia and was dying. There's an old man here who found them, one of the guys who found them. He's saying the first one they found in the pump house over there was really badly affected by the cold. He's so bad that he couldn't talk, he couldn't move. And they carried him, they put him on a tractor, they took him across the water to um, the shore and then put him in a car and took him off to the hospital. And uh, maybe, we don't know, maybe he died on the way to the hospital or, or in the hospital itself. But anyway, they're very sure he was still alive when he left their custody. Michael Asher goes on to ask about the capture of Dinga. In his book, McNabb describes a brutal beating and claims that one man tried to cut off Dinga's ear. <laughs> He said that nobody had any reason to hit him. He said he didn't put up a fight, he just surrendered. They just searched him, they found grenades on him, they took them away, and they took him off to the police headquarters, just walking normally, they said, you know? He didn't uh, put up any fight, they had no reason to beat him. It was pretty futile to swim across the river, if you think of it. I mean, all they did was came to a, 
an inhabited island, which the next morning was going to be crawling with farmers. I mean, they just had no chance. What were we going to do, shoot everybody? I mean, it was pretty much, again, you know, a waste of a life. By now, two men were dead and two had been captured. That just left patrol leader Andy McNabb on his own, hiding in a culvert here in this field. McNabb says he was spotted by an old goat herder, and Michael has found the very man who's lived here all his life. McNabb says his capture was brutal, but this shepherd has a very different story to tell. He says they gave him tea. He said he's absolutely certain, 100%, that nobody punched him, nobody kicked him, nobody treated him badly at all. He said all that happened was his hands were tied behind his back, he was made to kneel down like this, OK? And he said, I asked him, well, how was it possible for them for him to drink tea? And he told me that they, they poured the tea into his mouth, you know? And he said at first he, he tried to back away, he thought it was poisoned or something, uh, but somebody tasted the tea for him and uh, eventually sort of relaxed and drank it. Michael does not doubt that McNabb was physically beaten once in jail, but as he prepares to follow in the footsteps of the three remaining patrol, he finds that what admiration he had for McNabb has now evaporated. Well, I think we like heroes. I think we need heroes in this country, but I don't think that our search for heroes should obscure the truth. To me, knowing the truth is much more important than creating some myth out of our need to hero worship. After the split, Ryan describes how he, Stan and Vince spent a desperate day huddled together in a small dugout. As night approached, they set off north. All were crippled by the freezing cold. But remembering the promise he made to the family back in Britain, Michael Asher still wants to try to piece together what then happened to Vince Phillips. Accompanied by Abbas, Michael Asher has tracked down this man, Mohammed, who takes him to the spot where the three SAS men spent their first day after the split. It used to be a hole in the ground, but now has been covered up. He says he knows this is the place they spent the day because he found their footmarks. Their tracks were very distinctive. They couldn't have been made by any Arab or anybody living, living in this area. I mean, they really stood out, you know? They were quite distinct. Mohammed also tells Michael that he was the man who found Vince Phillips' body. Michael checks out his story by showing him some pictures to see if he can pick him out. Yeah, there's three of the patrol here, so I'll see if he's, he, which one he picks out. Any monkey twarini, yeah, Mohammed. Hey, you are admin, how the Rajal intelligent here now? Who are they? Who are they? Who are they? Who are they? Get on it. Hey, you Well, he pointed out the picture of Phillips, and uh, he said he's absolutely hundred percent certain that this is the man he found here. Oh, he came over to him, and he found the body was just lying on the ground, um, not curled up in a fetal position. Who? Where'd you fork? Where would you attack? Fork. His face was uh, uppermost, and he had belts across his body. He was wearing a camouflage jacket. Um, he said he was a very tall man, quite a good-looking man. He had a moustache curling down beside his mouth, um, and he was wearing a, uh, a gutra or shamag like this one, but, but, tall, uh, but longer, with the ends <coughs> tied across his body and round his back. And he found, he, he searched the body, he found in it a wallet, uh, with $70 in it, and there was also a photograph of uh, his wife and two children. He says that he does have a pair of binoculars that he found in the pocket, uh, very small binoculars, okay, and he took those home with him, he has them at home, and he's, he, he'll be able to show me them. These are the actual binoculars he found in uh, Vince Phillips' pocket. His own binoculars. So this gives me a sort of direct feeling of connection, you know, with Vince Phillips.
By the time Vince collapsed, all three SAS men were in very poor condition, suffering from exposure and hypothermia. Ryan himself says his memory of what happened is hazy and his mind was clouded. But they lost Vince late that evening. They looked for him, couldn't find him, so they left him behind. It was a terrible decision, but there was no alternative. Mohammed is able to confirm only some of Ryan's account. According to Mohammed, there were no tracks coming back towards the body, and he actually followed the tracks with five other people as far as the railway line, 15 kilometers from here. And he followed the tracks at least 15 kilometers to the railway line, and he's absolutely certain there were no tracks coming back. In the appalling conditions, Ryan and Stan had probably become disorientated and failed to find their way back to Vince. Michael Asher presses on, along the route taken by Ryan and Stan. Ryan writes that he and Stan became separated when Stan went off with an apparently friendly shepherd to find food and transport. He never returned. Ryan, of course, didn't witness Stan's capture, but this man, Al Haj Abdallah, says he saw it all. Uh, what happened was they arrived here, about 15 uh, policemen and soldiers arrived here. When the man saw them, he ran off and hid behind some stones over here. Uh, they surrounded him, they moved in on him, he just gave himself up. He handed his, uh, his rifle over to the policeman. He didn't say anything, he didn't try to shoot anybody, he didn't make any trouble at all. According to Ryan, when Stan, before Stan was captured, he actually shot three people whom he says were running out of this house. Three uh, policemen or jundis. And I'm going to ask the Haji now whether that's true. يعني صحيح هذا الرجل قتل ثلاثة من الجيش لما جاء هنا غير غير صحيح أيوة أبدا أيوة يعني he said it's completely untrue it's not true at all anyway they took him off there was no trouble he didn't put up any kind of a fight Nab claims that in the course of the events of Bravo 20, the patrol killed 250 people. Well, I've covered almost all of that ground. I mean, I haven't quite finished Ryan's journey, but I've covered a lot of that ground, and I haven't discovered a single person that they killed. And as far as I'm concerned, up to now, you know, far from being 250, the body count of Bravo 20 was zero. <laughs> The real problem with exaggerating or gilding the lily or whatever you want to call it is that when you're writing about war, it has consequences, dangerous consequences. It creates unrealistic expectations of what real soldiers fighting real wars are actually capable of. Chris Ryan walked for 200 kilometers over seven nights until he crossed the border with Syria. And Michael Asher is still doggedly in his footsteps. One thing left is Ryan's journey, which I think was a magnificent feat. Although, in view of the fact that he's exaggerated so much in his book, my desire to do the journey, to follow in his footsteps, has really diminished. Michael Asher reaches the river Euphrates. Chris Ryan had another four days walking ahead of him. But Michael Asher decides he's had enough of following in the footsteps of Bravo 2-0.